Um, I want to advise the members then that uh, it'll be recorded, this video will be made on the broadcast and recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. And obviously those in the public gallery are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode. And, uh, family Wi-Fi passwords um, <coughs> are available on the gallery rules and find the seats in the public gallery. Not for take, not permit to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Um, have we any apologies? Barrister says he was rolling late. He should be here soon. Thank you, Harry. Um, uh, chairperson's uh, business. No. No. Um, I su well, I suppose that. Uh, I should, say, I should say that uh, on behalf of the committee, I attended the briefing with the House of Lords um, EU committee, select committee here on two days ago, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Tuesday. Um, obviously, just try to highlight the most silly issues that have been raised here in the committee. And they were in a fact finding um, mission, I suppose, and they want to, they seem keen to continue to engage to find out what are the many issues of fact in here. So that was just to note. Um, Draft minutes. I want to refer members to the um, draft minutes at pages seven to thirteen. Your pack. Uh, are people content with those draft minutes? Content. Okay. I will give Elaine my autograph. Okay. Um, can I refer members to correspondence of page 15. Um, there's an, an action uh, against each piece of correspondence there in your pack. Uh, can you see it there? Is everybody okay with those actions? Yep. Um, I should. Uh, I just want to just draw your attention to the first item there. Um, I was contacted by Helena Cotton of the British Veterans Association regards hosting the event here, and it's been co-hosted by myself and Harry. And I think yourself, John. Is that right? That event, or maybe your. I think yeah. That's, yeah. That's one yeah. Of so me, uh, just want to give it a, a wee plug. If you could just maybe pencil it into your diary from the yeah. British Veterans Veterans Association, if you want to provide a briefing uh, to us here. Um, so, correspondence dealt with. In relation to the forward work program, uh, page 68 to 74 on your um, <coughs> table of papers. Uh, um, Stella, do you want to brief the committee? Yep, uh -huh. you can see um, up there, Jason. So I really want to take you to um, the 26th and 2nd of April. There's a little bit of flexibility around those days yet, depending on the, the final um, a timetable for the UK Environment Bill that we'd mentioned. But then post Easter, um, I wanted just to take you a look at a few of the um, dates that we've provisionally penciled in so far. Um, there will be a briefing from the Department on the Environment Strategy for Northern Ireland, which is relevant to what's happening today on the 23rd. I think that will be quite an important briefing for you. Um, we are looking at Balmoral's show on the 14th of March. That normally takes a place, the, the committee normally attend that instead of coming to the committee meeting on the 14th of March. Um, we're looking at doing a rural stakeholder event as well. We checked out, it doesn't look like we can do that in Valley Kelly, but if members are content, we'll look at doing that in um, Caffrey, one of the Caffrey locations perhaps, or even Forest Survey House, I haven't looked at, at those yet. Um, and I'm looking at doing a potential, um, in June then, a potential stake, um, Committee's uh, Strategic Planning Day. So we'd look at doing a half day um, and potentially we could maybe take that up to Bally Kelly House just for the committee to get out of the building and go away and take a half day to look at its strategic priorities and how it wants to move forward in the future. So um, more or less content with that sort of approach to begin with. Yeah, can I just maybe make a suggestion mm. in terms of that real uh, community stakeholders mm -hmm. event on the 20th of May. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest perhaps we consider Loughborough College because uh, apart from mm -hmm. the fact it's one of the Catholic colleges, that's also where um, the rural support charity is based and mm -hmm. also rural action. And I just think it might be appropriate if we had there, and especially with the issue of mental health being so prevalent yep. amongst our okay. um, rural communities, that it might be appropriate to have it there and get maybe, because the, there's been um, 
a new CEO, Veronica Morris, has been appointed of uh, rural, uh, rural support and might be an opportunity just to mm -hmm. hear from them and just meet with them, given the fact that this is such a, a, a big issue within, not just within rural, but across government. Will do. I will check out if there's rooms available. Okay. Okay. Are members content with that, more or less? Okay. <laughs> any suggest? No, sorry. Any suggestions for you? The one who's asking. Uh, that. Any any other further suggestions? Or is it, is it okay? Be okay, the forward program. Um, okay. So uh, item six on the agenda is the common agriculture policy. You'll find um, direct payments for farmers regulations 2020, uh, page 7683, and the correspondence from the minister at page 84. Um, the SR has been laid before the Assembly on the 25th of February 2020 under the confirmatory procedure and came into <coughs> operation on the 24th of February. Oral session on this SL1 and SR has been organised for the 12th of March. The purpose of the SL1 is to enable the 2020 direct payments to farmers to continue following the withdrawal from the EU and the end of the capped uh, direct payments legislation from the UK. The regulations will provide continuity and stability for direct payments recipients and our technical nature have no impact on policy. Um, are people okay that can move to the next stage? Okay. Can I remember the next two items on the agenda are in connection with the SRs and the sea fishing and licensing that we considered a few weeks ago? And the committee had initially agreed to annul the SRs and then received a letter from the minister indicating that they would be revoked. The two SRs that were about to be that we are about to consider are the revoking SRs. So that's. Um, Page 86, the sea fish <coughs> licensing order. Page 86 and 91 on your packs. Um, I'm going to put the question here. Um, is it okay? The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020 20, sea fishing, sea fishing licensing revo revocation order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to examiner statutory rules report is no objection to your rule. Intent. Right. Yeah. Sea fish licensing and noses revocation regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, page 83, 93 to 98 in your packs. I'm going to put the question. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020-21, the Sea Fishing Licence and Notice Revocation Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to examiner statute rules, the report has no objection to the rule. Are the members okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to receive an oral briefing uh, from the Research and Information Service on the UK Environment Bill. You'll find this to, uh, on pages 100, 100 to 149 in your pack. And I'd like to um, invite Susie uh, over here to, re to um, take, take a seat there to address the committee. Um, I'd also like to, a couple of things. I want to um, take this opportunity to express condolences of the committee to yourself, Susie, following the death of your uncle Cyril Cave, the well-known uh, BBC cameraman. So, on behalf of the committee, we really want to express our condolences to you. Thank you very much. And we also want to express your thanks to you as well. You have been working extremely hard under a very tight timeline to prepare a very detailed report. So I want to acknowledge the, the great work you've been doing and obviously in the context of your family uh, losing a loved one as well. So we're very appreciative that you're, you're even here today, Susan. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Okay. So thank you. Wanna, you. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that. Um, yes, I, I want to apologise for the size of this paper. Um, I mean, the bill itself is very large. It's 133 provisions, 19 schedules. I roughly counted about 57 of those provisions, and nine of those schedules extend to Northern Ireland. So really, there was no uh, short and fast way around this one. I won't go through the whole paper, you'll be glad to know, um, but I'm happy to discuss anything that I don't cover later. Um, the paper, as um, the chair's mentioned, <coughs> is on page 100 of your packs. Uh, it provides an overview of the key Northern Ireland specific components, some of which are unique to here, but also covers those wider UK elements that require le legislative consent from the Assembly. So I'll start with uh, section three on page 108 of your packs. This essentially just gives a summary of the bill and highlights in red the provisions that extend to Northern Ireland and whether an LCM will be sought. And these are mainly the provisions that I have focused on in more detail later in the, in the paper. I thought though that it might be useful uh, to members to show the provisions that don't extend to Northern Ireland, but that apply to other parts of the UK. However, in many cases, these have been identified as areas where corresponding... Yeah, that's what I said, 
provisions would be within the competence of the Northern Ireland Assembly. And these are listed on page 108. And they're also in uh, black text within the papers that are provided throughout, sec or the tables that are uh, throughout section three. For now, I'm gonna focus on section four and five of the paper. Section four gives more general overview and observations. And section five looks at uh, the provisions in slightly more detail. So section four starts on page 117. So this discusses some general observations, and these mainly cover the bulk of the observations made throughout the paper. The first point is with regards to the fact the bill is essentially a piece of enabling legislation for the production of regulations, some of which are to amend primary legislation. Most are subject to the affirmative procedure. However, in some cases, it is not clear whether DERA or the Secretary of State is responsible for making these regulations. Some parts of the bill apply across the UK to include Northern Ireland, where regulations are to be produced by the Secretary of State, but an LCM will not be sought in these cases. So just very quickly taking you through some of the um, observation points that I've made in bold. Um, really, does, does affirmative resolution give sufficient scrutiny, especially for amendments to primary legislation and the introduction, say, of new charging schemes, such as the uh, single-use plastics? In general, where would affirmative resolution take place? Westminster or the Northern Ireland Assembly? In some clauses, this is not clear. Some of the provisions don't extend to Northern Ireland, but have been identified as being within the competence of the Assembly. For example, environmental targets, separate collection of waste, biodiversity gain in planning considerations, conservation covenants. Is the Minister planning to bring legislation forward in these areas down the line, and by what means? Would some of the provisions in the Bill be best placed in primary legislation, similar to the approach taken with the Agriculture Bill in Scotland and Wales? In fact, it would appear that the Scottish Government is considering taking their own arrangements for the governance aspects of the Bill. Moving on then just to the consideration of the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol. Mark's paper did a very good job at explaining the Protocol in detail, but just briefly amongst other things, the Protocol effectively binds Northern Ireland to a series of EU regulations as they relate to a range of environmental standards surrounding, for example, products, goods and substances, waste and packaging. Northern Ireland is also required to automatically adopt any changes to the EU regulations listed in Annex 2. And any new EU regulations can be added to Annex 2, provided this is agreed by the Joint Committee. Now, whilst the Joint Committee will have a key role to play in the operation of the protocol, the European Commission and the European Court of Justice will ultimately have responsibility and powers to ensure that Northern Ireland adheres to the rules it is required to. Just a few observation points here. Have the proposed provisions within the Bill, whether they are UK-wide or Northern Ireland specific, been tested to see if they are compliant with the Protocol? If the Protocol limits or restricts some of the proposed provisions within the Bill, does this enhance the argument for a Northern Ireland Environmental Bill? Has any consideration been given to the potential impacts of regulatory divergence between GB and the EU with regards to the provisions? Northern Ireland could be vulnerable here, particularly if the scope of Annex 2 of the protocol expanded or if GB environmental legislation changed, for example, in relation to uh, REACH regulations, and this is discussed later in the paper on um, page 149. What concerns does DARA have in relation to an ability to influence any potential changes to Annex 2 of the protocol? In addition, who takes precedence should Northern Ireland find itself non-compliant with the protocol by, by implementing UK law that has maybe been subject to divergence uh, post-transition? And this also um, brings in the question in relation to non-regression as well. Um, and that is mentioned in clause uh, 19. And how will the principle in the statement for non-regression apply then to Northern Ireland? In relation to funding, the bill states costs associated, most of which um, are included with the, the setup and the running of the OEP. These are listed 
in more detail on page 120. The Government has stated that the Bill provides for the OEP to be established as a non-Crown body corporate funded through grant in aid. And again, more detail on this on page 122. Some observation points here. Uh, how much of the funding will go towards the OEP's operation in Northern Ireland? Will any funding come, in, come from the block grant? Will the OEP have a branch based in Northern Ireland? Will it have revenue generating abilities in Northern Ireland? Does the department have the resources for all the registrations, administrations and compliance schemes to be set up under the bill? And finally, should an OEP not extend to Northern Ireland, can some of this funding be allocated to the NIA or an independent environmental protection agency? Looking then at enforcement, this is covered in more detail on page 123. Post-transition, the role of the European Commission and the European Court of Justice um, in holding the UK government to account will instead be played by the OEP. However, it appears that the only means of enforcement by the OEP is through domestic judicial review. It does not appear to have any fine or infraction powers. The domestic JR process has been described as a lengthy and costly process, with concerns expressed in a House of Lords Select Committee report back in 2017 regarding its ability to replace the CJEU. Some observation points um, is enforcement by JR an, an efficient and cost-effective way to hold government to account in Northern Ireland? While DEFRA have indicated that the CJEU rarely used its powers to issue fines, was it more the threat that made, them, that made the system more effective? Will an OEP run alongside an NIEA? Should the Minister decide to introduce an IEPA in Northern Ireland, what would happen to the OEP? Would it run alongside it? Um, run, run alongside um, an IEPA? What about potential overlap with the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman, who also deals with complaints about public authorities in Northern Ireland? And how would this be addressed? So, moving on to some of the more specific areas that I've covered in the Bill in Section 5, it starts on page 123 of your packs. Um, starting with the production of an environmental improvement plan, the details of which are on page 126. Will an improvement plan be target or outcomes based? Will it be in line with the programme for government? Does the department have the necessary resources, personnel, expertise and equipment to collect, monitor and analyse and share the findings that are required alongside the improvement plan? Did the new environment strategy consultation take the requirements of an environmental improvement plan into consideration? And if not, will the department produce a new draft strategy for public consultation as part of the requirements under this bill, which we heard about <laughs> just before I started this um, briefing, actually? The setup and functions of the OEP in Northern Ireland, they're looked at on page 128. <coughs> Essentially, the scope of the OEP's scrutiny, advice, complaints and enforcement functions in Northern Ireland is determined by the definition of environmental law. And the definition of environmental law is provided on page 129 and 130 of your packs. I'm just going to move quickly through some of the, the observation points. Is UK law and Northern Ireland law to be treated the same or different by an OEP in Northern Ireland? Parts of this bill do not extend to Northern Ireland. Does this mean Northern Ireland must comply with these areas as UK law under the remit of the OEP, such as the biodiversity gain in planning in clauses 93 and 94? Does environmental law include EU law that Northern Ireland must adhere to, particularly that listed under Annex 2 of the protocol? Is anything in relation to... Why is anything in relation to disclosure of or access to information excluded from the definition of Northern Ireland environmental law? If the department may specify through regulation what falls within the definition of environmental law, does this give the department the power to exclude or include certain provisions under the OEP's remit as it may wish, albeit through draft um, affirmative scrutiny? What happens should there be any overlap of devolved matters between the OEP and DERA or NIEA? 
Could Northern Ireland potentially face enforcement from a number of bodies, for example, OEP in relation to complying with relevant environmental law? The Committee on Climate Change in relation to climate change under the Climate Change Act 2008 and the CJEU in relation to complying with legislation under the protocol. Does this essentially give reason for consideration of, Nor of Northern Ireland specific climate change legislation and an IEPA so enforcement could potentially be done under the one body? So moving on, uh, jumping to page 139 uh, in relation to plastics and deposit schemes. I have missed out a couple of sections there, but I'm conscious of time. Um, this explores the introduction of new provisions in Northern Ireland for deposit schemes, charges for single-use plastic and new provisions to the already established carrier bag charge. Some consideration points. Would a DRS entail changes in labelling and significant setup costs, particularly to small businesses? How would a DRS impact existing household recycling systems? Could the existence of a land border with a country that currently does not operate a DRS increase the potential for leakage of materials and subsequent fraudulent activity? The provisions appear to apply for charges for single-use plastic items. However, could the regulations provide a ban on single-use plastic items in line with the UK-wide consultation? And also the ban proposed by the EU. Also under the EU's ban is a proposed 90% collection target for plastic bottles by 2029. Will this be taken into consideration in any subsequent regulations? And when do the provisions in relation to producer responsibility, resource efficiency, deposit schemes, single-use plastic and carrier bags come into force in Northern Ireland? Does the two-month time frame suggested for England, Scotland and Wales apply to here as well? Moving on to waste, on page 142, this looks at provisions that apply to Northern Ireland in relation to the introduction of an electronic waste tracking system, hazardous waste, um, waste charging and regulation and enforcement. Just a few observation points here. Has the department the funding and resources to support an electronic waste tracking system? How does this fit in with the new waste management plan for Northern Ireland? Have these proposals been taken into consideration during its preparation? The separate collection of waste provisions in this bill does not extend to Northern Ireland. However, they have been identified as being under the Northern Ireland Assembly's competence. In the Department's briefing to the Committee on the 6th of February, officials suggested that stricter requirements for the separate collection of waste is needed. So in light of this, would the Minister consider introducing similar provisions in order to meet these targets? Another point um, really is in relation to the idea of common frameworks and uh, non-regression. Uh, there are areas in the bill that mention provisions for the implementation of certain EU legislation across the, e the UK. This includes under the Water Framework Directive in Clause 81 and REACH under Clause 125. Now, the Delegated Powers member Memorandum states that existing environmental targets are largely derived from EU law. When the UK leaves the EU, it may wish to set its own targets that differ and go beyond those of the EU that will have been retained for the time being in domestic law. So REACH is also listed under Annex 2 of the Protocol. So does this mean post-transition period the UK may make further amendments to diverge, whereas Northern Ireland is bound by the Protocol? Could this potentially make common frameworks difficult? Clause 59 is in relation to the Transfrontier shipment of waste, and it's on page 145. This allows the DEFRA, Secretary of State, to regulate the import, export or transport of waste for export. This includes banning or restricting waste import and exports. Now, an LCM will not be sought on this clause, however, I have included it in the paper um, because of the potential impact on exports of plastic. There does not appear to be any mention of a consultation with DERA or the devolved legislators in the drafting of these regulations. So what level of say will Northern Ireland have in the drafting of these? The Queen's speech and a ministerial statement accompanying the bill stated that a ban on plastic exports to OECD countries would be introduced through the bill. 
Yet there is no mention of this on the face of the bill. Will this come in regulations and what level of consultation will take place? Northern Ireland is bound to EU legislation on shipments of waste under the protocol, however the UK is not post-transition. <coughs> Could any differences in processes or costs result in Northern Ireland becoming the main thoroughfare for international shipments into the EU? What impacts have been considered in light of this? What checks and balances will there be? And will there be enough resources to deal with this? Finally, and this isn't actually covered in the paper, but yesterday the, the Welsh Government laid its LCM for the bill. Um, and in general, they're supportive of the bill as drafted. They have raised a few areas of concern that they'll seek more clarity on in relation to non-regression and the duty of the OEP to consult with devolved governance bodies. To say I'm uh, conscious of the time, this was a fly-through of the paper. Um, unfortunately, it asks more questions than it provides answers. A lot of these questions actually have been um, covered in the consultation document that the, the clerk had mentioned to you before. Um, I appreciate that um, it's difficult to answer anything at this stage until more detail is provided through the development of subsequent regulations. Um, and I also recommend that members may want to look at the House of Commons library briefing paper. Um, it gives a general overview of the whole bill and covers the non-Northern Ireland specific elements that uh, have not been included in my paper just due to time constraints. But again, I'm happy to discuss anything further and take questions. So, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Susie, for, that very, for your paper and that very comprehensive briefing. Um, the members want to uh, uh, Chair, thank you again. Susie, can I also uh, add my support to the comment that the Chair raised at the start of the meeting regarding your health and your circumstances and, and wish you well. Um, and thank you as well for the, this detailed report and your uh, very able presentation and explanation of it. One of the things I'm going to ask, I don't expect you to have a detailed answer because this is a question that's going to go um, frankly until we have more information and probably from the executive. But given that I'm likely to be raising this with other uh, representatives today and going forward, I'm going to ask you, there is scant mention in any of this of the independent, and, and, and with the exception of your own report, by the way, there is scant mention of the um, uh, Independent Environmental Protection Agency for Northern Ireland. Um, would you conclude that was simply because we don't know enough yet? Or is there potentially an avoidance of, a, of an issue that is going to bring major changes to our structures of environmental protection that exist currently? Um, and I'm asking this mindful of the fact that there is a commitment in a cross-party agreement mm. to deliver this, and that, that commitment is so very important to some of us in here and many people out there. Mm. Um, I understand that um, during the, you know, the development of this bill, um, the initial bill was produced last year um, and then it fell before um, the, the election. And uh, having spoken with some of the, um, the, the DEFRA officials involved, they said that they had had um, a lot of uh, communication and input here with officials. Whether it's just due to the fact that we've been down for the three years and the appetite for an IEPA at that stage and during the drafting, it was unsure and what direction once we um, came back and what direction a minister would take. Um, I think that's definitely something to explore with the minister. The minister, in his um, initial statement to the, the committee whenever we came back, um, touched upon the... Um, the issue of an IEPA, but I think uh, it's something that needs uh, explored a bit further to see what direction they want to take. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, Chair? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Susie. And again, it's just um, so valuable having your input and your report on this as well, because it is a huge bill and, and it just goes so far and so deeper potentially could um, and a lot of the concerns you raise um, I would share as well I think it just does open too many, so many more questions and it answers but in the context of the potential docu consultation document um, 
while we can go into then co consulting on a Northern Ireland specific framework within the bill, and that can be teased out through that consultation. Um, there's nothing really in there to, that makes me a wee bit more confident through that process, um, and I'm just wondering if you can maybe add anything to that. For example, we've just done an environmental consultation at the minute, but yet the department are saying that they won't share the information of that, that came in with that to inform the energy strategy and consultation that's out at the minute, yet the two would go pretty hand in hand. So just wondering, in, in, in terms of the consultation process, do you feel that that could work as a, as a, as a means to producing something solid for Northern Ireland? Um, it's maybe not your place to answer, but it, I mean, because um, I just think that this bill is is non-specific to Northern Ireland, and we have had a void, and we have a huge amount of catch up, and no time really to do it. And um, so, if we're going to go to consultation, you know, how can that, under the current systems that we have now, and um, that you know, information sharing isn't really happening to inform processes that should be going together. And again, to me, is raising more questions, going to another public consultation to get information that we should already have and be sharing amongst ourselves. Yeah. Um, to be honest, uh, before when I was writing this paper, I wasn't aware that the um, sort of the the principles and governance aspects were going out for consultation. So, actually, hearing that that they are, I think, is is a positive step. Um, it's. Again, it depends what the department will do with that and how they will use it. Um, obviously, with us, with the development of an environment strategy, mm. the development of a waste new waste management plan, there's an awful lot of cross-cutting issues. And I think that's something that the consultation document, I hope, has taken into consideration and how those will all feed into the operation of the OEP or IE. Yea, whatever both. direction we go, both. or both, um, <laughs> NIEA, both. yes, and how it's it's trying to tease out how everything will relate together, not even just in terms of how the strategies will be taken into consideration, but how an OEP will work alongside NIEA or an IEPA, the CJEU. You know, we've a number of different areas coming, and I understand that that's a complex area to try and describe and. Um, explain to members of the public as well. So um, it'll be interesting. I haven't had time myself to go through the, the detail of that um, consultation document, so um, I would quite like to go through it and see how that's been addressed and also you know, the elements of the protocol as well. So I'm not sure whether that really gives you much more uh, of an answer, probably just more questions, but mm -hmm. that's all I can really provide at this okay. time. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Susie. Very detailed, excellent work. I wonder, would you have any idea on the bottle return scheme? It says that there will be a loading to the, the customer. Have you any idea what, how much, you know, much money or percentage ways that will um, be to the customer? Well, the bill itself just uh, deals with the sort of the process and how that would operate, and so the a, a price would be at, you know um, would be added to the, the price of the, the product, and then the customer could um, get that price either or return to them that extra um, deposit price um, when they return it, either to the uh, seller or to maybe a designated return um, site. Um, there's some some countries have um, brought in um, their it's a it's a return system through um, I'm trying to remember the the name of it <laughs> but it's it's like a deposit um, sort of uh, system under a um, where you go to get your drinks. What is the name of the of the, the machine? A vending machine. Vending machine. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, my mind went blank. So yes, it's through a vending vending um, machine system, um, and uh, whether that's something that they would want to um, uh, look at here. But in terms of the actual price, um, I imagine that's going to come through in uh, in regulations. Um, whether that will be consulted Just on. Dr. We don't we don't know as well. So. Thank you. Chair. Yeah, 
Thank you. I'll come back here. Sorry, Susie. Okay, um, in the, in the bill touches on the environmental improvement plans, mm -hmm. um, but yet doesn't give anything in terms of who would set what targets, who would be accountable or responsible for meeting those, uh, and how that would be reviewed and upheld. Mm -hmm. Have you anything? I mean, have we missed anything in there in terms of how that would be working? Um, again, that's something that uh, really would possibly come through in detail in regulations. I, I understand the bill itself is so um, large and it really essentially provides the bones and then the regulations will provide more of the detail and I imagine that it will be um, covered in that. It was just something that I felt needed to be uh, flagged, especially going forward whenever regulations are being developed. Um, a lot of the plan um, will relate to the collection and monitoring of data and uh, really in terms of that it's more will that require any changes to processes that are currently um, done by the department and will that incur extra costs and more resourcing issues as well um, and then how those will tie into uh, when they're monitoring the programme for government if they're taken in and uh, we, you know, we would like to see some form of um, target or outcomes at least to to monitor against and again raises questions for me in terms of that, that data sharing will be absolutely critical in this you know and if we have a system where we don't share data between mm. ourselves already yep. um that raises more concerns for me too mm. and even uh, data sharing between the oep yep. um and then any of our authorities over here um, the Public Service Ombudsman as well, um, how, how that will go about too, because obviously they already have responsibility in relation to public authorities here. And uh, so what, if there's any overlap and how will communication to ensure that there isn't overlap as well, how, how that will operate. Okay, um, Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, apologies for being late. There was a four car shunt in the M2, so oh, wow. that was at a, practically a standstill. And I apologise, Susie, for missing your presentation, uh, but there's a few e questions I have uh, for you. Uh, the proposal does not give the OEP the power to find the government, uh, and I find that difficult because the government should be setting the standards, and I know it will have an impact on, on budgets and planning, etc., etc., but surely uh, the department and the government should have high standards that they wouldn't need to be found. But the ability to find them should still be there. Uh, waste recycling uh, may cause a burden on the rate pair because the authorities will have to issue uh, more collections, etc., etc. So how has that been factored in? Glad to see that the exports of plastic uh, are going to be banned to the OECD countries. However, what have we got in place to deal with the waste plastic we have here in Northern Ireland? And uh, there's a, a method, a proposed method, for electronic tagging of waste. It's the illegal waste that causes the problems and the destruction. How are we going to deal with that? Mm -hmm. Sorry for giving you so many questions. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Those are, those are important uh, points, and I might need you to uh, remind me of some of those as, as I uh, go through. So th the first one you talked about. Um, o OEP not having the power. Yes, to... um, not having the uh, fine for fines yep. and infractions. Yes, that's something that did raised in the paper, it, w it was an ongoing discussion even through the first um, uh, draft of the bill um, last year. Um, and from looking at the responses to those and the government's response was that they felt that there was no need to have fine um, uh, process um, in operation, that the CJEU never actually rarely used um, fine and infraction. Um, again, that's something that I raised that, well, was it never used, just was it more, it was the threat of it that um, created the effectiveness of the system. Um, but uh, again, that's something maybe that you could discuss with the, with the department. Okay. Um, and then uh, the collection of waste. Yeah, collection of waste. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the separate collection of waste under the bill um, doesn't actually extend uh, to Northern Ireland at, at this point. Now, it's, right. it's highlighted as being under the competence of the Assembly. So that would be, um, in other words, 
depending on whether a minister would uh, want to bring something forward uh, through your own legislation further down the line. Um, the officials in their briefing hinted at um, the importance of separate collections. So again, that's something that maybe we would like to ask the department if they, they would see this as something to, to um, develop. Um, your final one. Exports of plastic. Exports of plastic, yes. Um, this was an interesting one. Uh, essentially, my paper just was trying to cover the parts of the bill that apply specifically to Northern Ireland and that an LCM would be sought. And that was the initial. But um, in reading the, the, the proposal for the, the ban on plastics, it's not actually provided on the, the face of the bill. This was something that came with the, the um, statement and will come forward in regulations. Um, as it stands, in relation to any plastics here, the, the bill will require us to have a plastics charge, but um, no plastics ban as yet, as has been mentioned on the face of the bill. So again, <coughs> as you say, um, in trying to tackle the issue of plastics, it's whether, you know, charging for plastics, but whether a plastics ban would be considered in light of the, there was a recent um, UK consultation on proposing for a ban on plastics as well, and uh, the EU as well announced recently their um, introduction of a ban. So again, that's something um, I could ask. This is, somebody once said to me through you, Chair, the only thing that water, that the water companies manufacture is plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the other one was the electronic tagging of waste. Yes. It's really the illegal waste and how do we catch yes. up on that? Again, um, obviously with us being a unique case compared to the rest of the UK with bordering um, an EU um, country, it's uh, an issue that has been ongoing. That is something that you could certainly ask the department. I don't have answers for that right now, but again, uh, something that even uh, Claire was mentioning in terms of making sure that there is that communication, that there has been that appreciation for our unique circumstance and our border here, and that seems to be the, the main um, area of uh, concern in relation to illegal dumping. But um, there's a provision within the bill as well that allows for um, the department to um, recover costs for any illegal sites um, and, and that's a new um, that's, that's a new introduction yeah. so um, I think that would be interesting to explore further for us and um, in light of some of our uh, sites Let's see how it pans out chairman thank you very much for your patience thank you thank you very much Susie. Okay. William uh, can I also apologise? I was 45 minutes sitting on the motorway coming in, so I, I, I can assure you that I've been sitting here sitting on the motorway, so I apologise for <laughs> not being in to, to, to get your presentation. In relation to, uh, uh, Morris mentioned it, the ban on exports of polluting plastic, that is only to certain countries, is that what that means? To, yeah, to, to non, um, to OECD, <coughs> sorry, OECD countries. <coughs> so it still will be exported? Yeah. yeah, but not to those countries, yeah. yeah. That's what I thought that, that meant, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, John, John, are you looking in there? Uh, a very quick comment. Um, it's probably one we could take up the department as well. And, and I had a quick double check, and you had read something in the last 24 or 48 hours. Um, but an interesting statistic uh, with the big term that goes on is that if the Union, for example, introduced the plastic deposit return system, and in two years, the recycling of plastics um, in that regard has risen to 92 per cent. Okay. Thanks to you. Thank you, John. Um, okay. So, um, as we have uh, no other members, I'd like to um, thank Susie once again for her briefing and for her very comprehensive research paper, uh, particularly given the time frame that you had. Um, so, you're Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, before we start our next session, oral session, um, I refer members to the correspondence from the NA Food and Drink at page four to nine in your table papers. Uh, this contains a physician paper on the Environment Bill. Members may wish to consider this as, as we take evidence on the Environment Bill. Um, 
Can I also seek the committee's permission to publish all papers which the committee, committee has had sight of and considered in relation to the three LCMS on the committee's website? Yep. Is that okay? Um, okay, now we'll have the department, departmental uh, oral session from the uh, environment bill. And members can find the information in their packs, uh, the department briefing paper 151 to 152, the LCM Annex uh, A on page 152 to 165, Environment Bill LCM on page 168, 166 to 170, Environment Bill pages 171 to 414, the Environment Bill explanatory notes 415 to 622, and the Environmental Plan Specials the Government's Discussion Document at pages 652. Uh, 623652. I'd like to take the opportunity now to welcome John Mills, the Grade 5 De Director of Environment uh, Policy, Hazel Bleak's uh, Principal Officer Regulatory, Regulatory and Natural Resources Policy Division, and Carl BD Grade 7 uh, Environmental Team. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite the officials to um, brief the committee. So, Chair, could you give us the, the Pack page on that again. I oh, sorry. It's page one five one to one five two is the briefing paper, uh, and then following on from there. Yeah, following on, on from there. Really, yeah. It was on the wrong That's page. literally full. So you look. It's from one five one to six hundred yeah. six hundred and fifty two. Is <laughs> <laughs> at the end? It's five hundred pages there. You know. Better myself. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, th uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome the opportunity to speak to the committee about, about the Environment Bill, and apologies if, if some of this might be a bit repetitive on the last session. Um, the Bill is a Westminster Bill which deals with devolved matters, i.e. the environment, so therefore uh, the, the Northern Ireland provisions of the Bill need, need a legislative consent motion uh, through the Assembly. Uh, when legislative consent is sought, the, it's normal for the committee to do a report, um, prior to, to any debate. So anything we can do to assist with that, we're, we're happy to do so. Uh, the current position is that the Minister has sought executive agreement to lay the legislative consent motion uh, due to the significance of some of the provisions in the Environment Bill. As you've heard, they're quite wide ranging. Um, although we don't, uh, we don't really regard uh, the um, Bill as controversial, um, um, and uh, certainly in uh, second reading and in its, in its previous life, it received all party support. Uh, we hope to have the executive's agreement shortly, and we would intend to lay the legislative consent motion as soon as possible thereafter. Uh, just, just looking at the timetable going forward, we're trying to, up, trying to marry up the bill's timetable, obviously happening in Westminster, and the legislative consent uh, procedure, which will go through the Assembly. So the bill was introduced in Parliament into January. Um, a very similar previous version was introduced in uh, last year, but it fell on the general election. Second reading of the bill took place yesterday uh, and was received as a general support. Um, the next stage, the detailed consideration stage in Westminster will be, a uh, committee stage will be likely to commence in March sometime with report stage um, that soon thereafter as possible, but probably about the start of May, we think. And report stage is significant because that's the deadline for us to um, give legislative consent if the Assembly does do that. Um, it's possible that uh, committee stage may go quicker than we think, but um, we're, we're hoping that it'll stick with start of May. So fitting that then with the Northern Ireland timescale, our current plans are based on the executive agreement uh, and laying about the start of March. Um, then the committee will do its report, uh, something around the end of March, and debate will take place thereafter. We'll have to factor in the, um, the Easter recess, um, but hopefully uh, that timetable works to get legislative consent, if that's indeed what happens before uh, report stage. Uh, turning to the, what the bill's about, I should say that not all of it extends to Northern Ireland, as you've heard. There are really two main themes, I would say, to summarise very briefly. The first provides a legal framework for environmental governance post-Brexit, and the second makes provisions for a range of changes to specific environmental areas such as wastewater, biodiversity, as you've heard. Taking the first theme, environmental governance, this covers environmental targets, plans, principles and oversight. Uh, and the oversight through the Office of Environmental Protection. 
Um, I'll, I'll just make a point on, on having listened to the, the previous session. Um, the, the Office of Environmental Oversight is, to, is, is that it's oversight to hold government to account in the same way that the uh, European Commission held governments to account, and it is, that is to be distinguished from the environmental regulator, uh, the, the NIA, the NIA, Northern Ireland Environment Agency, part of DERA, of course, at the moment. And the, I mean, we could, we could expect perhaps one or two cases a year or a small number of cases, high profile cases a year for the OEP to deal with, whereas the Environment Agency, of course, is, is regulating thousands of instances of, 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 uh, of approvals and permitting throughout the year. So they're, they're very dis, uh, distinct functions. Uh, the, um, we're not doing the targets, as you've heard. Um, we are involved in all the other aspects on that. On the second theme, co we're uh, covering waste, which we've, as you've heard, we're quite extensively involved in. Air, water and chemicals, where we have minor involvement, and we're not involved in the biodiversity and conservation uh, aspects of the bill. Uh, the purpose of the, uh, the governance provisions is to address what's referred to as the environmental governance gap left after we leave the EU. Um, this involves translating environmental principles in EU treaties into domestic law and the establishment of the OEP, as I've said, uh, to replace the, the Commission's role. Uh, these provisions also include the preparation and publication of environmental improvement plans um, and the environmental strategy may well be the first of those in Northern Ireland. The main purpose of the waste provisions is to require producers to pay the full net cost of managing their products at the end of life to incentivise more sustainable use of resources, to allow deposit and return schemes to be established, to enable charges to be applied to specific single-use plastic items, enable government to set resource efficiency product standards and improve the management of waste, uh, enabling DERA to make regulations in relation to the electronic uh, tracking of waste. Um, other amendments are largely technical. Uh, participation has been on the basis uh, that decisions on implementation would be a matter for, the, for devolved ministers in the Assembly. This means there will need to be a debate in the Assembly to commence the Northern Ireland provisions, um, with one minor exception on chemicals. Um, as again, you've heard a discussion document on the future implementation of the plans principles and governance elements of the bill will issue shortly. I believe the com uh, committee's got a, received a draft of that document. Uh, there'll be an update shortly, which we'll provide to the committee. Um, consultation has taken place on a number of the specific elements of the bill. So on extended producer responsibility and deposit and return schemes, uh, there was an extensive uh, consultation um, across the UK in which Northern Ireland participated last year, and there will be further consultations on that. Um, the, uh, I just um, conclude by giving the committee a very brief readout of the, of the debate yesterday in the House of Commons. Um, so as I said, uh, the, the bill got through unopposed. Um, much of the debate, of course, centred around matters affecting England, air quality, tree planting in particular. Of the bill's provisions affecting Northern Ireland, the main issues raised were the independence and powers of the OEP. Uh, the requirement to have due regard to environmental principles, um, both the, the, the angle there is probably that the bill isn't strong enough, and uh, the, the fact that there's no uh, commitment to non-regression or no non-regression clause for Northern Ireland. Um, I, I, we were going to offer uh, uh, to, to, um, to take you through the details of, of, the, of the bill if you wanted further, but you've already had a session on that, so we're, we're happy to, to provide uh, more detail or take questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that uh, briefing, uh, John. Uh, there are a number of members who have asked, uh, who have signalled that they want to ask some questions. And <coughs> trying to absorb a lot of information here from our, um, our table of papers and our packs. Um, I suppose, that just to start off with some questions, um, in relation to the um, the, the, the non-regression, um, we note from reading some of the narrative relating to the bill um, that there <coughs> hadn't been a specific consultation on the bill, but they'd relied on previous previously conducted, conducted consultations. And in the pre-legislative scrutiny report by DEFRA in 2018, it made the point that there was no equivalence to their protections 
that were provided by the EU and there was significant regression. Now, obviously, that causes a lot of concern for here, particularly given the fact that we have an Irish protocol now relating to these matters. So, what's your, what's the department's opinion on that? Well, on the on the non-regression clause, there has been a non-regression clause put in for England. Um, we uh, were not offered uh, the opportunity to participate in that. It is, at the end of the day, DEFRA's bill. Um, so uh, there is no non-regression clause for uh, Northern Ireland. That is the short answer to that. And what's the implications of that for the protocol, the Irish protocol? Um, the, the, well, the protocol, um, as you've heard, requires um, uh, uh, adherence to about 300 odd regulations uh, in Annex 2 and 4 of the protocol, um, and uh, Northern Ireland will need to uh, adhere to those. That's what the that's what the protocol says, uh, and the purpose of those, of course, is to uh, they largely. Deter are, are about uh, goods, about facilitating free trade in goods. So um, that that but that that's a requirement that uh, Northern Ireland follow those uh, regulations. Uh, and you see the fact that emissions and waste uh, no 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 boundaries. How will all that, does all that sit with the the strand two arrangements that we have here? Um, well, there's no, there's there's nothing in the bill that would. Um, would contradict um, the, um, the 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 requirements, the Good Friday Agreement, and the the um, the, uh, the North South Ministerial Council and other arrangements. Um. Right, I'll move on. Right, um, Philip. Thank you, uh, Chair. You actually asked one of the questions I was going to ask, uh, <laughs> but in relation to some of the points you made, I'm going to keep my points general and maybe uh, be allowed back in later on to ask specifics, but you said the bill isn't being <coughs> controversial, uh, and you also then at the finish mentioned some of the uh, comments in relation to uh, <coughs> the Westminster debate yesterday about weakening current provisions. I mean, can I just ask you, for your assessment with regard to the, the legislation in the north, is this going to is this bill going to weaken current environmental protections that we have within the EU uh, in the here and now? Is it going to weaken our potential to strengthen uh, environmental laws in the future? I, I, I listened on the way up, for example, to the survey today about the 130 million tons of waste. Uh, on our roads and countryside, and I mean, there was a bit of commentary about current EU legislation that would have a positive impact with regard to that, that we, were, we are now not uh, part of. So if you could factor that into your response. And also, just following on from the Chair, in relation to, because it, it, it is complicated, and I understand we're maybe not at the point where we can answer some of these questions, but we're talking about the the... OEP, uh, and, but we also have the protocol, and we're talking about the potential for regulatory divergence between here and uh, the island across the water. So what actually, in, in your view, because I, mean, I listen to uh, British politicians talking about the withdrawal agreement uh, and the political agreement and their assessment of things that they can now do that don't seem to be my assessment of what they can do. In terms of your view, what actually takes precedence with regard to uh, the, the, the protocol for this island and any potential OEP uh, with, so that we have some semblance of knowledge where we are at in the future. And the other thing then, just in relation to uh, the Scotland and Wales taking forward their own bill, uh, I mean, has the Minister any sense of producing uh, a bill here for the, for the North, uh, and I mean, in, in terms of your view, would that be a sensible approach to take? Okay, uh, I'll try and, maybe, uh, try and um, pick up on those, and um, maybe my colleagues will correct me if I've missed some of the things. Um, will, will this bill weaken um, uh, environmental protection here? Well, I think 
there are, there are people who have the view that leaving the EU will weaken um, uh, environmental protection here. On the other hand, the government has said that um, it will maintain uh, environmental standards. So I think that is the issue. The bill will absolutely not weaken. Um, uh, there's nothing in the bill that will weaken environmental protections. What it will do is maintain as far as uh, possible um, some of the things that were in the EU that we would otherwise lose. So the, the environmental principles are in EU treaties and have to be observed. When we leave the, uh, the, the, those treaties, um, if, we, if, 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 there was no, if the principles weren't reinstated, as it were, into domestic law by this bill, that would be something that would, uh, we would lose that. Similarly, we have oversight through the Commission and the European Court of Justice and um, if we didn't have an OEP to replace that, we would again lose that. In terms of what people say about are these things strong enough, um, well, it, uh, the, the, certainly in terms of uh, being able to impose fines for infraction, the OEP won't be able to do that as the Commissioner or as the European Court of Justice can. But then, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a mechanism outside the, outside the state, so it could do that. You, you couldn't really, um, um, ultimate, ultimately, the, the, the OEP can't, can't ever be as independent as the, as the Commission would have been. Um, on the protocol, I, I, um, I hesitate to get drawn into, um, uh, into comments on the, on the meaning of the protocol. I think we're, we're seeing negotiating positions set out and, and um, and uh, the uh, committees set up who, who are supposed to deal with the interpretation of how the protocol works. But the, the bottom line in terms of um, the, the force of the protocol, the, 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 the 2020 Withdrawal Act that went through Parliament in January says that the agreement of which the protocol is part is part of UK law, so the, the, uh, the protocol is is, is law, and uh, that says that as far as Northern Ireland's concerned, those, um, those regulations which are identified in the protocol have to be obeyed. Now, there will, there will have to be some work between to, to see how that is interpreted. Um, and, uh, I, simp simp I can't comment on that. I mean, that work's ongoing. The um, Scotland and Wales um, doing their own bills. Um, Yes, uh, on, on environmental governance, they chose to do that. Interestingly, Wales consulted, and they did get quite a, a big uh, kickback saying that they would have been better going with the OEP. So um, there's popular support or support for these measures around uh, other jurisdictions. Um, is the minister um, uh, thinking of bringing forward uh, a bill as well, the, um, I think the Minister's view is that, uh, that, that this is enough uh, to be going on with at the moment um, and uh, let's get this in place. Um, the, uh, the, the fact that this would be, if the, if, the, if the bill gets legislative consent and is implemented, it won't prevent Northern Ireland from doing, uh, making changes to it or doing things in addition that it wants to do. If the bill doesn't go forward, it is unlikely that um, there will be uh, governance arrangements in place in time, and uh, the, you may end up with this gap at the end of 20, at the end of this year, when when we, indeed we don't have environmental principles and we don't have um, uh, environmental oversight. Okay. Just picking up on that OEP issue, I note that the. The Welsh have have expressed concern about the OEP, um, you know, around the role with the devolved administrations, um, role that they have, and also note as well that there's provision for the OEP to be extend to be extended here, and it's actually the Secretary of State that does the appointments, and appointing members to it. Um, I would be I'm concerned about about the fact that there doesn't appear to be any. Um, What's the involvement of the, of, of the Assembly here uh, in relation to the OEP? What's Deere's position on it? On, 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 on the appointments? OEP. 
Um, uh, you want to get that, Hazel? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I mean, basically that was something that we had flagged up with DEFRA, uh -huh. that if the OEP is to be extended here and its remit is to extend to, to Northern Ireland, um, we wanted to be sure that it wasn't just viewed as an English body operating in Northern Ireland, um, that there needed to be Northern Ireland representation and that the Assembly needed to have a role in certain aspects um, as uh -huh. well, and there'd be accountability in, in Northern Ireland for, for the OEP's functions here. Um, so in terms of the appointments, um, assuming um, we did decide to um, extend it to Northern Ireland, um, the chair of the OEP would have to be appointed jointly by the DEFRA Secretary of State and by DERA, um, so there is a role there. Um, we've also um, ensured that there's provision in the bill um, that a, Northern Ireland, a specific Northern Ireland member would be appointed to the OEP board um, to ensure that um, Northern Ireland's interests are represented um, adequately and that Northern Ireland member would be appointed by DERA. Uh -huh. um, they would have to consult the DEFRA Secretary of State and the Chair of the OEP, but the appointment would actually be by DERA. Um, and DERA would also be consulted on the appointment of all the other non-executive members of the board. Um, in terms of accountability, um, the OEP would have to um, lay its strategy, its annual reports, and it's certified annual accounts before the Northern Ireland Assembly as well as before Parliament. Thank you. Isn't, Phil, do you want to discuss, did you want something quick on that before we move around? Hi, there was just, I mean, there was other questions that had been raised earlier on about the OEP, you know, in terms of funding, you know, is, you know, will, will the North be expected to fund or is that money coming out of the block grant? I mean, you'd ask some of the accountability questions that I was asking about in terms of funding. Yeah, I mean, I think to be fair, we're still at a very early stage in that process, simply because at this stage we don't know for sure whether the OEP is going to be extended here. That will be a matter, you know, for, for yourselves and for the Assembly. Um, so um, we haven't got into that detail with DEFRA. I think as far as we've got is that, yes, if it's extended here, Northern Ireland will be expected to make a contribution um, to the funding of the OEP in terms of how that would work or the amount we'd be expected to contribute. We just don't know at this stage. That's something that would have to be looked at if we decided to go ahead. I'll move on ahead, John. Chair, sure, thank you, and can I thank you, John, and, and, and you and your colleagues for being here and what we've heard so far. Um, I have a, uh, two or three questions for you, I think, here. That, uh, um, some of which has been touched on, and I'll try to go into it at a different angle or, or with some different uh, lines of questioning if I can, but I have to say to start with that the, what I'm hearing of the OEP um, with the potential to have one Northern Ireland person appointed to a body that sits um, elsewhere in these islands um, is a long way short of independent environmental protection. That is something that we were not actually promised ourselves. We are the people who promised it in a cross-party agreement at the start of this year and it's something that some of us are determined to, to deliver on. But uh, I have to emphasise as strongly as I can that, that what is explained here in this bill, and I fully understand that it was outside the control of DERA um, to, 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 to do the bill otherwise, but what is there currently um, is, is some way short of where we need to be in relation to independent environmental protection. Can I ask then, uh, in that regard, um, what preparations are being made? Um, to establish that independent environmental protection agency, which would have to, one would have thought, work alongside whatever structures emanate from, from this bill. And can I ask specifically what ministerial directives or uh, objectives are being set in relation to the establishment of that independent protection agency and its establishment in Northern Ireland? Um, separate to that, on, on the business of, and this is a more general question, on the business of the um, deposit return scheme for, for plastics products, um, is it not the case that these conversations are very similar um, to, to the conversations that took place when the plastic bag levy was introduced? Um, I, I referenced earlier, uh, I think you were here to hear it, that, that in, in other places they have introduced these schemes. There have been massive um, improvements in the plastic recycling. So, uh, stemming from that, can I ask what analysis is the department carrying out of international actions in relation to this, and what success there has been or otherwise in those instances? And thirdly, and finally, in relation to the protocol, and this has been touched on already by, by others, Philip and the chair in particular, 
Um, specifically, what preparation is currently being made for readiness for the protocol? What ministerial action has been taken to ensure that we deliver the preparation of protocol, given the time frame involved? And is there a time frame which can be published and shared with us so that this committee and the Assembly generally knows where we are in relation towards progress um, before we reach the end of the period? <coughs> okay. Um, on the... Um on those, uh, the you, you, you referenced um, the, the, the the OEP has been elsewhere in these islands. Well, the, the, some of that, um, the detail of, um, of 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 the implementation detail hasn't been uh, decided yet and wouldn't wouldn't be in the bill. So the bill is just establishing the legal framework, I guess, for this. So it is not. Uh, it may be that there is a, a Northern Ireland office. Uh, and that it isn't, and that the OEP isn't elsewhere in in, in these islands. As I say it will be, it will be as Hazel said, it will be Northern Ireland's uh, accountability body as well as England's. Um, I guess the more uh, there will be a cost to that. But um, the um, on the objectives um, for um, for the uh, for what I take it talking about the independent um, the independent. Environmental regulator, i.e., the role of the N NIEA, um, advice as as, <coughs> as going going to the minister. I guess um, the minister might uh, uh, say in terms of, of, of what the agreement says. It says that those um, uh, that'll be considered as part of a, a program for government, um, but uh, certainly I think it's accepted that there would need to be some scoping um, around the. Um, uh, around the uh, uh, establishment of an independent agency in terms of um, the uh, costs, uh, the time scale to make legislative changes and things like personnel uh, changes and so on. So there would inevitably be, uh, um, have to be that work. Uh, on the relationship with the o between the OEP and a potentially independent agency, um, wouldn't really see that as that problematic because you, you've got to remember that elsewhere in jurisdictions there's an independent independent agency Wales England and the OEP will uh, well the OEP will fit with England anyway. Um, sorry if I've missed anything on those on the DRS. Absolutely, uh, I think you, you you're right to point to uh, some of those examples. Uh, I think we we've looked at Germany and indeed some of my. Uh, people in my division went over to see reverse vending machines and how the system works in, in Germany, uh, where there is very high um, uh, recycling rates for, 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 for plastics. And I think it would it be right in saying that it's generally accepted that if you have targets of 80 90%, um, the, the, the DRS system is, is the only way you can really achieve these. We, obviously, our current rate of recycling is, is, uh, is just is 50%. A, a great achievement, in, incidentally, uh, over the, the past uh, decade to achieve that European target. Uh, the protocol, I, I, I simply can't answer uh, uh, those questions about timeframes, publishing, and, and what steps are being taken. Um, with a de we have a central body in, in DERA that, um, uh, that, that does that. I mean, obviously, we can, we can note your questions and take it back. Thank you. Okay, and Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much for, for the presentation. Um, I completely understand what you're saying in terms of that this bill is not being viewed as a controversial and that it's an overarching and you know we can fill in regulations and gaps along the way. Where it starts to become a bit controversial and perhaps politically controversial for me is that this bill contains no legal binding targets for Northern Ireland and while we do have uh, the Ireland Northern Ireland protocol in place we're also um, hearing reports coming that um, the Prime Minister and his department are looking at ways to get around that, that protocol that that is actively being done um, so within this bill we have nothing specific for Northern Ireland, although we have the international treaty informed the protocol and a political system willing to 
circumnavigate that as far as possible. So that's where it gets controversial for me and that element of scrutiny becomes really, really critical. Um, the OEP then, while we could set it up, um, we're going to be asked for legislative consent for this while we're not protected within it and a political system willing to you know, override any protections that we do have outside of that. And for the OEP to be set up and operational in Northern Ireland, um, we can shape that if it's going to happen. Um, but was there any discussions with the department and DEFRA in terms of trying to include binding targets, include commitments to uphold the protocol or to implement and establish the independent environmental protection agency as was given under the new decade, new approach deal as well? Okay, on, on those three and perhaps um, somebody will add to this, the, um, uh, yes we have raised uh, with DEFRA the question of how um, the uh, role of the uh, OEP might uh, dovetail or, or work with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, that uh, that work is ongoing. Um, we uh, did uh, discuss with DEFRA uh, the question of uh, the independent um, environmental regulator, um, if you like, NIE's role. And our line very much then, I have to say, was that um, when we're developing the bill, that is not a matter for, that officials would want to uh, go near, and it was a matter for elected representatives. Um, and uh, on the targets, I, why did we not do the targets? Uh, um, again, so similar, similar reasons, I think, but yeah, Carl, if you yeah, could well, sort of it predates my involvement with the bill, but, um, but yes, as, as I understand, there was a, a, a concern about you know, officials you know, taking that policy direction uh, during a period of suspension. When, um, so uh, the, the other thing was, of course, that um, at that time, England had its 25-year uh, environment plan. Um, and a lot of those targets were flew out of that. Um, we uh, didn't and don't uh, have a, a similar uh, uh, document at, at the moment, but we are working towards our environment strategy for Northern Ireland, which is likely to become our, uh, our first environmental improvement plan. And targets will have to flow out of that, and I think we've recognised in, in developing that that we need to take a, a, a different look at, at how we measure um, environmental uh, protection, environmental improvement, and that you know we, we will be looking at that as part of the strategy itself. Um, and then, if uh, legislation is needed beyond that, then we look at that. Then, can I just ask, following up on that, then, so we're putting together our own environment strategy. Have we got? timeline for that? Do we know when the strategy is going to be produced? Well, the, the, the consultation, for, again, this was uh, the, the consultation document, discussion document went out yep. again before the, the, the institutions returned here. Um, and um, obviously we, we felt that it was best not to um, actually uh, put policy proposals in that document in the absence of the minister. Um, so that document went out essentially asking uh, stakeholders for their views on what should be in the strategy, uh, how ambitious we should be uh, for their big ideas, as we as we put it. And um, the uh, that consultation closed on the fifth of February, and the response rate was was very high, approximately two and a half thousand responses Eight. to that within Northern Ireland, which exceeded our expectations. Um, those responses are now being um, analysed by the, the team that's working on that. Um, and, um, and I know that, uh, that you know, the Minister has stated that the environment strategy is one of his priorities. Um, as for a timeline, we don't know that yet, but uh, certainly it is being you know, actively resourced and actively worked on. So that, the responses to that environment strategy, are the departments sharing that with other um, departments or even inter-department bodies to try and inform other strategies that are out at the minute as well, in terms of the energy strategy, for example? Yeah. I, I, I don't know the okay. specific answer to that question. Okay. I mean, I, I know that uh, you know we have had a lot of uh, discussions with uh, with other departments yeah. in terms of uh, of what else is being done to, to try and uh, join things up as, as best we can. I, I can't think why we wouldn't be be doing that. To be honest, and, uh, certainly Neither. last week I was I, I was given a presentation at the opening of consultation on the energy strategy, uh, and then conversely we had a meeting on uh, a future generations meeting on on climate change. 
uh, chaired by the Minister, which uh, was on the theme of energy and, uh, uh, and the energy strategy was, was, uh, was a, a, part, a part of that. So I, I think we're quite well joined up. GDPR is what I'm hearing, but anyway, so I'll maybe take a step back then. So if we are currently trying to put together an environment strategy, which we have no time line for, which has got a huge um, response rate to, yet we are going to be asked to give legislative consent to a bill that is not protecting us um, in the hope that we will have a strategy in sometime in the future where we can start to fill in the gaps I, with no political yeah. will and no certainty within that? I think, I think the, the point I would want to make on that is that us, uh, or the, the Assembly granting uh, legislative consent for this doesn't tie us in any way to implementing any of the, uh, the provisions, uh, the, uh, the devolved provisions in the Bill. Um, um, almost all of them are subject to commencement by a commencement order that would be subject to the draft affirmative procedure um, in the Assembly. Um, and then, as, uh, as Susie mentioned earlier, there are a lot of enabling powers in this bill. So then those regulations, uh, if they were being made by, uh, by DERA, um, then they would also be, um, would, would, would go through committee scrutiny and, and, uh, and the Assembly um, as well. Um, so, so there's, there's uh, the, the granting of legislative consent does not, you know, sign anything away. We, you know, we, we still have control over uh, what happens with the implementation of, of all of the provisions. Um, there's, there, there's one provision that uh, is not commenced by uh, commencement order, and even that would require uh, the consent of DERA and Department for Economy uh, in order to, uh, to, to make regulations for that. So, for example, I mean, if you take the specific bit in the bill about the environmental improvement plans, which is the bit which is relates to the, the strategy, yep. uh, I mean, even if, if legislative consent is granted and in the future the Assembly decides they want to implement those provisions and put the strategy on a legislative fitting, um, so they want to bring that those provisions in the bill in here, um, you know, the Assembly could choose not to do that until such times as the strategy had been fully developed and the targets were in place under the strategy, um, and there's nothing to stop the Assembly from making legislation to enshrine those targets in legislation. There's nothing in the Environment Bill that would prevent that from happening. No, I understand that. Politics in the background, of course. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Claire, um, have you got Rosemary? Yeah, uh -huh. I want to just uh, go back a little. Mine's a more general question. Do you really have the infrastructure to introduce this bill? Um, I'm talking, you know, yeah, you talk about the elect electronic tagging of devices on yeah. waste products, that type of thing. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a, a good follow-up question to, to what we've just been saying, because the answer is, do we have it now? No, the bill is largely a framework. Um, and so on electronic tagging or electronic tracking, um, we don't have that uh, infrastructure at the moment. Uh, we have a collection of, 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 of systems that are paper-based, uh, that aren't complete, uh, um, and hopefully that the bill will give us the powers to replace that with a, a, a comprehensive system of, of, of electronic tracking that will allow us to um, follow waste uh, wherever it goes, um, and that is probably, um, it's not obviously in law, but the, there's a project on at the moment at which we're at, um, the, the, we're getting down to the uh, selected bidder for somebody to provide a system, um, but that'll be 2021, 20, at the earliest before that system is in place. And similarly, I won't go through all, all, all the provisions, but similarly, there are um, powers there to allow us to uh, reform or extend producer responsibility schemes, which um, uh, you know are attempt to to reduce the amount of packaging. Um, and uh, there's another round of consultations to go on them, and on the deposit and return uh, scheme, there'll be another round of consultations. So those will be 2022, 2023. So yes, uh, some of this is 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 really a framework. Yeah, and. Um what about dealing with the illegal waste? Um, well, the, uh, the, the the environment agency is uh, has 
ongoing measures to uh, to, to deal with illegal waste. Um, and our operational colleagues in the agency will be have, uh, will be uh, uh, attempting to enforce uh, and prevent that. Mm -hmm. And lastly, have you given any thought to the cost of these resources? Um, yes, the bill covers a, a, a lot of ground um, on um, uh, on things like the. Uh, uh, on the, the establishment of the uh, OEP, as Hazel said, we, there will be a cost to Northern Ireland. Uh, we don't know what that is yet. Um, uh, other things like a deposit and return scheme and uh, the um, uh, extended producer responsibilities will be paid for by, uh, by, by industry, by those who, if you like, uh, create the, the, the pollution problem. Uh, so that will not have, that will have financial implications but it won't be have the government funding incidentally on on, on enforcement and, and tackling crime the bill does have one or two measures in there uh, not extensive but some measures in there to uh, enable a wider range of penalties to be used by the agency um, that's not one of the main features of the bill but okay mine was just a wee quick question <coughs> on some of the things that claire was talking about in terms of the environmental strategy evolving into an environmental plan. Uh, and maybe I read this incorrectly. I, I, I thought I read somewhere that within a year of the this becoming law, there had to be an environmental plan. And if that's right, I mean, how does the strategy evolve to become a plan? Is there more consultation, or is it just literally become one become the other? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the, that, uh the, the time period uh, referred to is, is uh, measured from whenever the provision is commenced. So we would not be looking to commence that until we were in a position to uh, to, to um, publish a strategy. Okay. Um, so um, that said, you know we would expect to be um, to be doing it sooner rather than later. Okay. And in the process, does one look the strategy? Just do we just change the title of it, or what happens? <coughs> we, 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 can, we don't even need to change the, the, the title of it. It's, it's just we designate it as, as our uh, okay. as our environmental improvement plan. John. Thanks, Chair. Two issues arising from the, from the broader discussions and the additional questions, which are that um, uh, I'm recalling uh, that, that John, you, you said you're in the, you're, some of your answers that you would expect an OEP would be dealing with maybe one or two, at current rates, one or two high profile cases per year. So I suppose I'm, I'm going to ask for as close uh, to a detailed answer as you can give uh, at this time on what constitutes a high profile case and I would draw a comparison for example with the concern that I have raised many times in writing to, to the department, to the minister and I'm hoping to be so soon on, on the floor of the assembly um, in relation to proportionality between pollution and the fines imposed for those who pollute and also the rates of detection and prosecution in that regard. So, so what is high profile? Is it Mubai? and below or my boy and above, for example. Um, and also, um, going back to, to the cost that, that Rosemary quite rightly raised in relation to the, the duties being imposed upon us by, by this bill and, and other factors um, in EU exit, uh, it's probably worth making the point that the Minister Chair released information just a couple of days ago about £2.2 .2 million pounds for environmental schemes coming from the plastic bag levy. So it may well be that their costs were recouped and community engagement being able to be nurtured as well from monies brought back from any deposit return scheme? Uh, yeah, uh, on, on that last one, uh, again, we're approaching a second round of, of consultation, so I, I, I couldn't answer uh, on on that, but um, uh, certainly the, the, the environment scheme does allow from the, the plastic, um, the carrier bag levy does provide a lot of funding for environmental projects. What's high profile? Well, uh, my boy certainly is, but the, when, when I say uh, high profile, I'm really, um, uh, it's probably the, uh, the wrong words, but I, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the number of EU infractions that, that we've got at the moment. So um, I'm really um, um, uh, looking at, at that we would get one or two a year, um, something like that, and we probably have Mm, half a dozen or, or a few more 
outstanding over over a number of years. So I, I, by hope high profile, I, I sort of meant in that sort of category, things like the harbour porpoises one that's ongoing at the moment. High level. Yeah, high, high level is, is a better uh, term than high profile. Yeah, I think it's important to make the distinction between the types of cases that the agency and IEA would be taken as enforcement cases, you know, do you say cause yeah, and pollution and that type of thing, and the OEP would be taking quite distinct cases from that, and they would be much higher level, yeah. But which in turn, Chair, if we can get back right briefly, which in turn shows and demonstrates clearly the, the need for uh, an environmental protection stroke enforcement agency to do the, the day and daily uh, protection duties uh, as best as can uh, as it can. Okay. Okay, John. Um, just, uh, I want to just ask, also just ask the question as well. Parallel to the work that we're doing here in the Environment Bill, we're also considering the Agriculture Bill and the implications for here. Now, some exchanges that I just, I just read Yesterday, perhaps it was between uh, Ministry or George Eustace and the National Farmers uh, Union in Britain. Um, it looks, and from some of the evidence we picked up here, it looks suspiciously like that Britain uh, doesn't plan to include minimum food standards in their agriculture bill, and their um, obviously their payments for farmers are going to be like for public goods, very strong environmental. Target. So, obviously, there's a fear amongst the farming community, indeed here as well, because that's a large export market for here, is that uh, Britain is really going to more or less um, sell out their farmers as far as food production is concerned and import from uh, the rest of the world. Um, maybe from areas with far lower welfare, uh, animal welfare, far lower environmental standards. So they're going to improve their own environmental uh, targets but you know, have a far higher carbon footprint in terms of entering into world trade deals from uh, with our countries with less standards. So just wondering, what um, what is the implications of the Environment Bill for the Agriculture Bill and indeed for, for farmers? Um, well, I, I read those the stories as well and I... I, 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 I I, have, I don't think I've, I've anything to, to, to add to them. The, 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 um, the um, unless you can think off the top of my head, the, I mean, the, the, the OEP, uh, the Office of Environmental Protection, will oversee all uh, actions. So that could be that could impact on agriculture. Um, if, if agriculture affects the environment, the principles would apply to all departments. So that will apply to DERA with its role in agriculture um, at that level. Um, I, 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 I mean, we, we've looked at the, we've done the rural proofing as we've needed to do at high level, and we, we haven't identified any uh, particular impacts on uh, for agriculture. Yeah. Um, thanks, John. Uh, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome. I think it's important that, yes, environmental strategies are in place and all the rest, but we have been a member of Europe for 50 years, and during that time, we look at Macaroni where millions of tons were dumped. Some of it exported, a lot of it from another jurisdiction even. Uh, no matter what you put in place, if there's those that are going to break the rules and prepare to break the law, and there's a lot of money to be made in doing that, there needs to be, I'm not sure whether this end can be built into legislation where, you know, we see these guys that made millions going to court and find 10,000. So there's no deterrent, no real deterrent for <coughs> For those people that are prepared to break the, the rules, it's all very fine, you know, making rules uh, that, in a small way, are adhered to, but in, in other ways, are not adhered to. And I think it's very important uh, that I'm not too sure if there's any legislation can be built in there that the courts can, when someone is brought to court for something as major as that, that they can be dealt with properly and not give a slap on the wrist, because that's literally what has happened in the past, you know. Make absolute millions out of this, and and the fines ten thousand pounds, you know. So for me, for me, you can put all the strategies in the world in place, but if you don't deal with those that break the rules, um, I think you have a problem. Yes, the, 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 at the end of the day, that uh, 
the bill as a framework and um, the, um, that is down to a variety of factors um, uh, such as enforcement. I guess a lot of my operational colleagues wouldn't, wouldn't disagree with, with you on the, on the scale of fines, but the bill doesn't, doesn't address that. Um, what it does do through, um, uh, through some of the waste provisions is to uh, take us in a direction uh, and support a direction where recycling is done more and more so there is less waste and if, if as we say, if waste is, has, a, has a value, say to a plastic bottle, a drinks bottle goes back for 10p or 20p or whatever, the, then it is less likely to be one littered and two dumped if there's sort of some sort of... Um, uh, absolutely, and I'm fully behind that. I think that is good, and I mean, I think we, we need to do what we can to do the best that we can in relation to that. It's just, uh, you know, for me, it just seems that there are those that will break rules and to get away with it, you know. I think it's difficult for us to, to legislate for um, the, the penalties that are imposed in courts, because obviously yeah. the judiciary is independent. I mean, there's lots of environmental law that has unlimited yeah. fines uh, for, for transgressions. And, you know, but it's it's a matter for the courts to decide what they um, what they well, actually uh, impose. I understand that, but it seems too trivial in yeah. some cities. Yeah. Absolutely. Needs to be tougher. Mm -hmm. I agree. Especially for those that's making millions of doing it, of breaking the rules. Okay, um, Claire. Thank you, and we'll come back again. <laughs> I'm just wondering, so obviously this is legislation come from Westminster and we will be implementing it under the statutory rules process, but primary legislation will be stronger legislation. Is the department working on any type of primary legislation for Northern Ireland? Uh, no. Um, this, this, I mean, the bill is primary legislation as well, but... Um, and but statutory for Northern Ireland when we implement yes. it? When, uh, so, as has been said, a lot of it's framework, so uh, to, to give a crude definition, it says that uh, the, the, the DERA by regulations, as you say, um, can set up an electronic tracking system. Yep. And uh, those, uh, those will be done by statutory rules of Northern Ireland, and there'll be an affirmative debate on those in the Assembly to get them through. And... Um, they will, there'll, be, there'll be public consultations on things like that beforehand anyway. Um, if, if the Assembly, say, gave legislative consent to this and then said, well, actually, we, we don't like certain aspects of it in the future, then that would take primary legislation. But Northern Ireland primary legislation could amend this, uh, this legislation that's in the bill anyway. And, but that's not being currently looked at or worked on, any primary legislative level? Uh, not no. for. Uh, no. um, uh, I'm trying to think across. Well, obviously, there's the fisheries bill and the agricultural bill yeah. are, are both ongoing, and there's the uh, agricultural um, uh, fund payments bill as well. Um, where the, can either of you think of any other primary that's on? Um, I don't think there's any Northern Ireland primary, obviously, with the, the institutions the just, just being yeah. back uh, yeah. running, yeah. but um, yeah, uh, as to what we is, what is planned, we don't know. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and then there's no sunset clause in this for us. So if we were minded to be putting primary legislation together, um, there's no sunset clause within this bill at the minute to encourage us to do that either. Is there? No. no. Uh, there is. There is. There is not. Um, but there would be nothing to stop okay. the assembly. Um, introducing this one day and changing it the next day. Okay, and, and for other amendments, so obviously it's got its second reading yesterday in the House of Commons, um, and is there still time to do any amendments at Westminster um, with this bill? Yes. Okay, and what's the latest... If the government agrees. Yeah, so, and then we can do anything when it comes at the legislative consent then in terms of adding the sunset clause, that all has to be done at Westminster? Uh, no, we would have to persuade um, the uh, DEFRA to make changes to the bill. Okay. At the moment, it's their bill. And that's still possible? 
yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it is possible to do it, yeah. whether it is possible to persuade DEFRA to do it is a different <laughs> question. It's okay, but there is still time. Yes. There is there is still time. Committee stage is the main yeah. uh, stage, and that's that's March. So. And how long is that? Do you think how long before we see this coming to the assembly? What's the last point? Well, I mean, we could debate uh, this here. It, it is normal uh, for us to uh, grant legislative consent um, for in time for report stage, which would be early May. Um, it, it is technically possible to do it after that, but that provision is generally uh, there for any um, amendments, new clauses that are that are added into yeah. the bill, which would then also require legislative consent. Yep. Um, but, um, before they've been included in the bill. So, but yes, there is time for uh, most of the amendments will be made at, uh, at committee stage, um, which will be starting in the middle of March. Thank you. For a few weeks, Carl? Uh, six to eight weeks is what there is. It's probably going to be six weeks uh, for committee stage. Uh, Thank so, you. So, yeah, uh, just can I make maybe a suggestion? Because uh, we did this with the agriculture bill. Perhaps we could forward the um, proceedings of the Hansard of this committee to the Environmental Bills Committee at Westminster. Would that, that be in order? Okay. Yep. Um, so at least we're feeding in thoughts from here. Great. Thank you. Um, um, Morris. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, it's already been alluded to that if this bill it could use be used as a sort of yardstick or, or a basis for our own environmental plan, uh, which thankfully has got good cross-party support. Uh, and the chairman raised a valid point that it dovetails well into agriculture, and especially with the increase in phosphorus in our waterways. Uh, William, just a point that the, uh, the fines for polluters is just not high enough. And I'm thinking a lot along the lines of waterways where, uh, after a pollution incident, the rivers have to be restocked and uh, they have to be cleaned. But polluters should also have a duty of care to improve the river bank improve the rivers and improve the river beds if they pollute in the first instance so that would be another deterrent that they'd have to face if they pollute the river then they're going to do environmental improvement plans as part of their their fine just a few things you know that maybe we could factor in thank okay. you Morris. yeah um, do i respond to that or? uh i think as as carl has said i know the, the I'm not sure how generally to say that. I mean, I, I don't know what the um, what the maximum penalties are for um, for for uh, polluting rivers are, um, um, at, or what the law is on restoration, uh, uh, making people carry out restoration. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, we really do have quite strong legislation yeah. in that regard in the um, environmental environmental liability regulations of uh, 2009. Which uh, is exactly what, what they were set up for. Uh, so it's uh, you know, pollution to, to waterways uh, or, or to land, um, and or um, affecting health. Um, so you know there, there are um, there's a requirement in that to restore, uh, or if it yeah, it can't be restored, you know if the damage is, is, is irreversible, that um, there'd be um, a compensatory remediation mm -hmm. done somewhere else to improve another another area. So it generally intended to be used on fairly um, high-level cases as well, but it is very strong legislation came out of a, a European directive. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, I'd like to um, thank you very much for... Oh, sorry. I was kind of going to be that one because I've been on yeah. twice, so I was waiting until then. Yeah. I, mean, I, I was just... I mean, a number, number of us have asked about the relationship uh, between the OEP and the protocol. I mean, I accept we were given an answer, but... Uh, I, I think it would do no harm, uh, Chair, through you, if the committee maybe asked for a, a written briefing in back. relation to it, just so we've something in writing uh, with regard to it. And, uh, if you're happy enough? Absolutely, and you know, what would also uh, deal with the issue of regression, um, which has been flagged up in Wales as well, which and, and in the context of that, be fair enough. Yep. Yeah, a good suggestion. Everybody agreed to it. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to thank you very much. Um, Thank you, John Carl, for coming here this morning, and no doubt we'll be seeing you in the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, um, I should have said before, before you leave, there are a couple of uh, things perhaps that we should, that we will pick up on, uh, we can pick up on writing to you as anyway, as re regards the Executive Subcommittee on the EU exit, um, you know, and do they have, what role do they have in terms of decision-making power and um, making recommendations to the Assembly? And, 
which draws to consent to. So maybe we can pick that up, and or maybe do we want to deal with it now? You know, the that the the executive yeah. subcommittee um, on EU exit has its terms of reference has been laid in the assembly. Um, do you, are you aware that the, if the environment bill has been scrutinised or seen by this uh, committee at all, the executive subcommittee? No, it hasn't. It hasn't. Okay. Well, um, okay, maybe that's something we can pick up on again. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks very much, Ian. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're moving swiftly on now, members. Uh, we're going to have an oral evidence session from the NI Environment Link. As the briefing paper is on page 654 to 661 in your packs. And we're just waiting for the representatives to come in. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you here to the, the committee this morning, uh, Craig McGuckin, uh, McGuckin uh, Chief Executive Officer of NA Environment Link, Joanne Sherwood, Director of the RSPP, and I, Victoria McGuigan, External Affairs Manager of the National Trust, and Jean Clark, the Nature Protection Officer with the RS. A PB and a. Uh, can I advise you that uh, if you could take 10 minutes to brief the committee and then afterwards the, the committee will take the opportunity to ask some questions of these. Okay, so if you want to just pick off. Okay, you. thank you. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you, uh, committee members, for having us here today. Um, you've already received our written evidence, so we just have a short presentation for you. So, Northern Ireland Environment Link is the networking and forum uh, organisation for. Uh, organisations with an interest in the environment in Northern Ireland. We have about 65 full members representing over 120,000 individuals, so that's a fairly good <coughs> segment of the Northern Irish society. Uh, the, the membership manages more than 300,000 acres of land. They deliver a wide range of programmes. Now, the people that you've got here today um, are part of Environment Link's Nature Matters campaign group, and this was set up to advocate for the best possible environment after we leave the EU. So with regards to the Environment Bill then, um, I think that whenever we consider the bill it's, uh, as it is currently drafted, uh, I think that there are a number of underlying issues that need to be remembered. The first thing is that we are in the middle of a climate and biodiversity crisis. Reports like the State of Nature from 2019 clearly highlight the scale of the habitat loss, the pollution and the growing impacts of climate change. In Northern Ireland, we've lost more wildlife than any other part of the UK. We have very low levels of woodland cover. Less than a third of our rivers are reported as being in good condition. 11% of the species found here are in threat from extinction. And just today, the National Trust have published the YouGov poll, which found that 86% of adults in Northern Ireland think that it's important to see stronger laws to protect the environment. And you'll be interested in this. 84% believe that politicians could do more to help nature. So as the UK leaves the EU, Northern Ireland's political leaders have a real opportunity to set an ambitious programme of legislation and policies that reverse the environmental trends and show that they're listening to the public, and particularly to young people who are very engaged in this topic. It's clear that there should be no regression on current levels of environmental protection and oversight, and in fact, this level should increase. The second point we would make is that the UK remains a signatory, of course, to a range of international agreements that function to provide environmental protection, such as the Good Friday Agreement, the Aarhus Convention, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this means that we have to continue to legislate for and work to meet these international standards. Thirdly, in the recent New Decade, New Approach Agreement. Um, it includes a number of environment-related items, including the establishment of an independent environmental protection agency and climate change legislation. And the fourth point would be that the Environment Bill itself is one of three bills, along with agriculture and fisheries, that include provisions in Northern Ireland. And taken together, these will provide an important legislative framework that will help shape the future for people in Northern Ireland 
and a high-quality environment will be needed to support food production, jobs, health and well-being. So given this perspective, the question is, will this bill fulfil the aim, as is frequently being repeated by different ministers, that this generation will leave the environment in a better state than when we inherited it? And the ans answer is that while we welcome many aspects of the bill, by itself and in its current form, we think it's unlikely to achieve this objective. So I'm just going to say a few things about uh, the, the bill itself. Um, in general, we support the provisions that can extend to Northern Ireland, but we feel that the bill in its current uh, state needs to be strengthened. And I would say at this point that if there are amendments to the bill, we'd be very happy to come back and speak with you again or provide more evidence. We're going to focus on two areas. We're going to focus on environmental governments, governance and uh, the Environment Improvement Plan. With regards to governance, first of all, Historically, um, internal environmental governance in Northern Ireland has been weak. There have been a number of high-profile failings over the years. Northern Ireland remains the only part of the UK without an independent environment protection agency, with statutory responsibilities for nature conservation and environmental regulation. Following the transition period, Northern Ireland is also at risk of being in a governance gap whereby we will not have the oversight of the EU institutions, which have provided a, a large proportion of um, environmental law and policy. So therefore, we welcome the extension of the OEP to Northern Ireland, but we would have a few comments, a few caveats on that. We feel that a timeline for the OEP establishment um, should be established. There's an obvious resourcing requirement that we need to, uh, we need to see, we need to highlight. <coughs> we feel that this Stormont Assembly should have oversight of the Northern Irish appointee to the OEP. We feel there needs to be clarification on any interim governance arrangements. We also note that the OEP's powers in Northern Ireland are more limited than they would be in England, and we feel this is wrong. We think there needs to be clarification on cross-border links. So while the OEP partially fulfils the governance gap resulting from exiting the EU and its governance structures, it should be said, it should be reiterated that it will not address the record of domestic governance feelings in Northern Ireland. And so that we therefore feel that we also require the establishment of an independent uh, EPA. Secondly, then, with regards to the Environmental Improvement Plan, we feel that Northern Ireland very clearly needs a new environment strategy. Um, and we would like to thank the department, actually, for the work that they've done uh, over the past uh, six months to a year on the environment strategy. We think the strategy needs to be developed in partnership with the wider sector. It needs to be underpinned by a clear commitment on non-regression. Uh, it should be broad and encompassing the full range of the environment, land, air, fresh water and marine. It needs to be endorsed across the executive. It needs to, be, it needs to have buy-in from all the departments. Um, it also needs to be time-bound. It, it needs to have commitment to uh, resources. It needs to have targets. And furthermore, most importantly, I think it needs to have some form of legislative footing uh, through a specific Northern Ireland bill. So in conclusion, we welcome many aspects of the bill, but there are areas that need improvement or clarification. As with any piece of legislation, um, this needs to be resourced. Halting the climate and biodiversity crises comes at a cost. However, we feel that this provides a crucial opportunity for Northern Ireland. There are enormous economic and social benefits from investing in our environment, and the cost of failure will be much higher. So thank you for listening. Um, as a coalition here today, our focus is really on the environmental governance uh, and the improvement plan, uh, but we will try to answer any other questions you have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Craig, for that um, for your presentation there. Um, I suppose there's just a, a couple of things I want to just pick up with you. Uh, in relation to the um, environment bill across the water, and we're looking through some of the papers relating to that there, one of the, the, the concerns that was flagged up, and also by, by the Welsh as well, is, that, is around the non-regression. And also, um, in, the, in the notes from a report by DEFRA in 2019 from some of the stakeholders, that it stated that this would not provide the equivalent protections uh, that we have within the EU, in fact, it has pointed to some significant regression. What, what would be your, would you, how do you feel about that? You know, would, would you share that concern as well? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I think it, it's, a, it's a key point that's been brought up across, um, especially yesterday in the second reading, 
um, there was a clear understanding that this bill does not commit to non-regression. Um, and that is a concern because although obviously there is a need to put the powers to DEFRA and DERA to, to take forward future legislation, there is a need to commit very strongly to not regressing. So while the door is open, it needs to be very much shut to not going any lower than we currently have. And you see in relation to the, um, the, o, the OEP was quite topical here in, in the last, um, the last uh, from the, the department rep representatives were here previously. How, how would you see that OEP's role interfacing with the, um, the proposed independent EPA? I will say many of the concerns which you flagged up uh, just in your presentation there now, we have flagged up the department just previously around oversight, the role of the Assembly and that, the extraordinary role by the Secretary of State in terms of appointments to it and all. So how, would you, how specifically would you see that interfacing with the proposed uh, EPA? Um, I think to consider the OEP and the EPA, there's a need to consider what is the need for the two bodies. Um, the independent EPA has been long recognised as needed yeah. for Northern Ireland. Um, the OEP, the need for the OEP, stems from the fact that we will lose the oversight of the EU institutions. Yeah. Um, in terms of oversight of the OEP appointment that is uh, provisioned within the Environment Bill as it's laid, we do believe that Northern Ireland should have more oversight over that for the fact that it should be a Northern Ireland expert. They should have sufficient understanding. Um, but again, yeah, they, they both have very distinct but complementary functions and remits. <coughs> we'll move on around. Philip? You I just, on, in relation to the last point, because uh, the Chair's right, we, I mean, we, we laboured about the OEP earlier on when the department were in. I mean, are, are you satisfied that, you know, one individual fr from the North is satisfactory on a, like, two item wide OEP, or w would you suggest a separate OEP, uh, I mean, just given the nature of the protocol, the legislation, all of that here, and the particular requirements, I mean, I'm just trying to tease out, is, is that better, or one individual will they have the same kind of powers or remit? Uh, and then secondly, just with regard to the environment strategy, because again, we uh, raised that, and, and, and I mean, the department's view is that the environment strategy will evolve or just become the environmental plan. Uh, so, your concerns, because consultations now closed. Uh, I mean, are you, are you saying that there, there need to be more work or greater thought given before it, you know the department makes any decisions on that? Or just a bit more clarity on some of your points around the environmental strategy. Well, in terms of the strategy, um, the situation of the strategy is an initial discussion document has closed. So what's meant to happen now is that the, the department should <coughs> should be taking that feedback and just start fitting that into the development of some kind of strategy. Now, we've had discussions with the department, so we would really hope that they would be speaking with the sector and that we would be that there'd be a bit of co-production in terms of what's, what, what's in that. Um, I don't know the time frame there, but obviously, if we're saying that the strategy um, is the is the um, EIP, then there's a there's a, a time pressure there. So we do need to get that underway. But as I said, whenever I was talking, you know, the department have done fairly well. We we would say in terms of pulling the the, the strategy stuff together, and we do want to work with them. Two thousand five hundred uh, responses they said earlier on, which is a, a, a high level. Yeah. So if I could just uh, follow up, thank you. Um, I think what's clear is that the environment strategy may continue to evolve, but what's really important is that it has ambitious targets within it, uh, that those are time-bound, that they're measurable. Um, we talked about non-regression. What is clear is that even with the EU legislation, there is a crisis in nature and in climate, so 11 uh, percent of species face extinction in Northern Ireland. So non-regression to me is a minimum. You know, we have a real opportunity here to set ambition you know, and, and real ambition that takes us into the future. Um, I, so I think those targets probably need to be in the bill. They need to be statutory. They need to be monitored. There needs to be a mechanism then for following up. Now, you asked the question about an OEP and whether one member was satisfactory. Uh, I think it's, you know, that is obviously a decision about how many, many members are on it. It's a political decision. Um, I think at the very least, it needs to be visible and present in yeah. this country to be able to do the job it needs to have that expertise and I think one of the real issues is that the mechanism for recourse here is different to the mechanism for recourse in England so in Northern Ireland it can only have recourse to judicial review 
or decision notices. And uh, those are both fairly weak mechanisms and potentially fairly ineffective <coughs> mechanisms in comparison to some of the, the recourse that the, uh, the European institutions have had historically. Okay. The OEP holds the overall system and the government to account. So the question is, how can you do that effectively? And what are the mechanisms and the levers that can be pulled to do that so that, that things change? Okay, and John. Thank you. Can I, through the chair, apologise first of all, Craig, for missing the first part of your um, presentation? And hopefully, you'll understand that, ironically, as, as the environment committee is sitting today, uh, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful is also having an event upstairs, and it promised to speak to somebody individually there for a couple of minutes. So, apologies for my absence. It was down to that reason and no other. Can I ask you, um, colleagues? Have, have Demonstrated to you, I think that that would be pushing on these questions about, you know, how um, uh, OEP and Independent Environmental Protection Agency would fit together, what the roles would be, and the potential problems uh, therein or for, for clashes. Uh, can I ask you more broadly? It probably fits with what Joanne mentioned there, with threats to to number of species uh, in Northern Ireland. How best can we try to steer the framework of this to protect? Um, I, uh, issues, uh, matters that, that Joanne raised there around species, habitat restoration, particularly where there's going to be um, a border between an EU border involved as well for environmental protection. Have you any thoughts on how we can best steer those frameworks as they evolve for environmental protection to ensure that these matters are addressed? Do you want to say something about the different um, remits of the, of the different organisations? Yes, yeah, so again, it's the, there is a distinct difference between their two remits. The OEP would hold the public authorities to um, uh, account and the EPA would obviously up to determine by the minister their function, but it would be uh, individuals and organisations. So they do, they do fit very much together um, or beside each other. I think it's the point that Joanne made about targets. That will be a kind of a key point. Currently within the, um, the bill, there is no requirement for environment approval plans to be underpinned by targets. But the question would be raised as to how do you monitor a, t a plan if you have no target to meet? So we would hope that, and we believe that the, the, the strongest way of you know, guiding that framework of future environmental protection would be set a clear objective of high level of environmental protection across land, sea, freshwater and air, and then targets would be then, fun they would function to meet that objective. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it goes back to that point again about the fact that there, this is one of three bills, that a future agriculture bill will then feed into that you know, achievement of a high level protection, and fisheries bill would do the same. But yes, it's the targets, but we strongly would say that they, they have to be underpinned in legislation. Um, going back on that, Chair, sorry if I didn't explain it properly there at the start, but it's the, the agency, whatever the agency c c came forward out of this then, it would be that the agency that should be concentrating on those targets and implement them and working with community voluntary and charity sectors to make, make sure that those targets were correct. Yeah, apologies, I think there's a bit, bit of confusion from my part, but yes, obviously the um, the bill as it stands requires DERA to monitor the plans, yeah. but we would say that an EPA, an independent EPA, should have that role. Um, and would have the sufficient expertise to determine whether those targets are being met. Thank you. Thank you. And just to your point, you, you very helpfully raised the, um, the points that Joanne raised earlier about nature's decline and, and threats to species. We believe that actually, yes, this is a framework bill. This is, a, this is something that's happening, I suppose, because of the moment in time we find ourselves in with, with, with Brexit and, and having not had the decision-making powers in place in Northern Ireland over, over the last while. Um, so, so, yeah, it's not an ideal situation in terms of how you would want to, to design the legislative process. What we would say is once, if, however, this bill goes through, um, we want to see decision-making made locally. So we would like there to be laws locally. So, so to build upon this, this, this sets a direction and it's actually to build upon this. What we want to see is a nature and environment bill that is owned and led by the Assembly. Um, and and that, within that you would look at things like nature, nature restoration networks um, and you would look at nature-based solutions for the, the climate crisis. So um, that, we would like to see that locally owned and the ambition to be set by the local MLAs. Thank you. Okay, um, Harry. Thank you, Chair. As directed, 
to Craig for some comments he made earlier. Bird populations are considered to be a good indicator of the broad state of the wildlife on the countryside. Since 1994, wild birds have increased 49 per cent. Although, like not all birds have increased, the, the wetland birds have increased by like 12 per cent. I'm just wondering, is there one particular reason why the wetland birds have decreased? Address. I think one of my RSPB colleagues might be better placed than me to, uh, okay. to answer That's that fine. one. Yeah, so it's some of the more specialist uh, birds that are probably unique to um, particular areas in Northern Ireland that have decreased most. Uh, the State of Nature report showed that there was a number of reasons amongst that, most notably how land had been managed historically. Um, and that land management has taken away some of the habitat that uh, those birds require to live. So if you think about places like um, uh, the Garan Plateau and the Uplands, you know, how it was grazed, the sorts of animals used, and some of the changes that have happened there, working in partnership, where we've worked in partnership with farmers, and um, in some instances more traditional breeds have come back in, but the grazing regime has changed, the cutting regime has changed, and that has then allowed those birds to come back in. They're not secure yet, but what we can what we can definitely see is we know uh, in, in many instances, not in all, but in many instances what needs to be done to change their fortunes. Okay. And I think that was the link, Victoria mentioned the link between the, the various bills. That's why the, the various bills together need to operate as, as a whole um, to achieve that direction um, and not be siloed. Chair, I mean, overall, then, you think that's a reasonably good picture? Um, I think nature is still on threat. I think many, many species are in decline, so 15% at risk of extinction. We've actually lost more wildlife in Northern Ireland than any other part of the UK. And the previous State of Nature report um, showed that in Northern Ireland, the biodiversity intactness index in Northern Ireland, we were the lowest of the four countries of the UK and really very far down in comparison to European countries. So that's a measure of how intact the habitats are. You know, butterflies, 43% decrease since 2006. You know, it's just uh, uh, many, many species are in decline. So, so there is a real nature crisis here alongside the climate crisis. And in particular, rare species, which is... Yeah, things that would have been common historically, though they're only they're rare because they have yes. declined. So they would have been common things like curlew, things like chuff, things like lapwing. So it's those those kinds of things that you would expect to see in the sort of habitat and sort of countryside you get in Northern Ireland. Thank you, John. Thanks, Chair. Morris. Okay, Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I mean, I can remember as a young boy we had curlew, concrete freshwater shrimp, Utes of Plenty, mm -hmm. and we had things called lint dams where you had plenty of uh, aquatic life, etc., etc. Now we have none of that, and most of our, our rivers have been drained to flow fast and uh, take the water away from the land, so we've, lo we've lost our, 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 uh, our marshes and so on and so forth. But do you see the bill promoting or not promoting a change of habitat, promotion of habitat, and the re restoration of habitat. Uh, the Minister himself has quite a, a keen interest in uh, an extensive pre tree planting scheme, which I would like to see extended to perhaps new planning applications. There should be something in there that the, there has to be a landscape accompanied uh, landscape uh, program accompanying the build. How do you see that? So, so suppose. When we're thinking about the bill and its application in Northern Ireland, we need to remember that it underpins the Environmental Improvement Plan. So, if we, the, the, which is the current strategy that the, the consultation has just closed upon, so within that strategy, it sets out lots of really good ideas around how to restore that, um, re restore nature, how to address the declines in the health of water, in the health of air, um, in, the, in how we manage natural resources um, in Northern Ireland. So I suppose a direct answer around whether or not the bill will help that, it depends on whether or not the bill gives teeth to 
through teeth and targets actually to um, to the implementation <coughs> of a plan. So yeah, um, that's what we want. We want that the, the bill will be quite strong around helping us to set targets. So at the minute, the bill, it's a good start. It, it, it sets a direction. It talks about, um, it, it sets the need for the department to create this plan and it sets the need for the department to report upon this plan and actually to, to bring reports forward to the assembly. So in terms of transparency and accountability, it, it, it sets a good direction. What we think is missing is the, is the need for targets um, because without those are we really going to be holding people to, to account and, and actually having big ambition around addressing the scale of the crisis that we face. Yeah, absolutely. Chair, I think targets are very important and we should try and establish them. They're vital to work towards it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Just bring yeah, can I just make a comment? You asked specifically about trees, so I think um, you know, we've got the lowest woodland cover in the UK, so you know that, that clearly is not a great, a great um, statistic. I think it's about the right tree in the right place. Um, you know, I, I don't think any of us would really want to see trees on some of the peatland, for example, because the peatland holds more carbon. So we would be actually probably, you know, going against some of the climate change uh, mitigation. So I think very much the, the the right tree in the right place is the is the answer. Carefully managed. Carefully managed. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Claire. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for being here and your presentation. Sorry that I had to leave the room and miss it, but just want to rest assured I have read what you've submitted um, in great detail and agree with everything. I've not enough lot more. I'd like to see more in it. So thank you, and I think you've done a great job in your respective fields so far as well. And I just want to maybe stress what Joanne's really pointing out here as well, that the extent of the threatened species that Northern Ireland has um, and also the level of extinction that we're seeing uh, and just really stress that there is no coming back from extinction. Once it's gone, it's gone. And that's the, our loss. It's everybody's loss on that one. Um, and, and so we have so much to do in terms to stem that uh, and to try and rebuild uh, in terms of the threatened wildlife uh, and habitats. Um, and Victoria, when you're saying you know, they're really keen to work with the departments and that while this is a good overarching framework in terms of the bill, that it's up to us at a local level to fill in um, and meet our own targets. What I would maybe like to ask from you all is do you feel that we have a level of expertise in Northern Ireland to drive this work forward? Um, and in particular, do we have the right people are people capable of taking up any appointed roles or new positions to come in and be that voice of protection and accountability? Look, I, I would say that um, the first thing I suppose I would say is that in terms of our connections, our connect, the connectivity that we have, um, if you look at uh, that, the link organisation at Neil, you know, we have connections obviously across the United Kingdom and cross border as well. So we do have access to a lot of expertise ourselves mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the, the bigger NGOs across the rest of the UK. Um, in terms of, if you look, if you, look you know, uh, and within our own sector, even just people working here in Northern Ireland, of course, you know, I think there's some great people there. If you look more widely across the sector and you look at the department, I think there's some very good people. You know, so I, m my personal view is I think that we do have we do have good people here in Northern Ireland and we do have strong linkages and we've got international linkages. So, you know, I feel, that, I feel that's quite strong. I think what I would add is I think there's a question about capacity uh, and, uh, you know, whether that's, you know, people and whether it's budget to be able to do these things. It's, it's kind of an invest-to-save situation that we're in, you know. Um, I think, I think we've all become aware that nature kind of underpins some of the services that we all want to enjoy, whether that's, you know, material things we want to enjoy, whether it's going outside and, in, you know, uh, enjoying nature, whether it's clean water, clean air, it provides that underpinning sort of ecosystem services. So, so that takes people to be able to look at that and make sure that those services are all intact and being provided as they could. So, so there are some very good people. I also think if we have the right jobs at the right levels, people will come back. I came back five years ago. You know, I worked across the water for 28 years. I know I don't look that old, but 28 <laughs> years. And, um, you know, I came back. So I think, I think um, there, there, there are, and, and there are all the links as well, as, as Craig has said, both between the government departments, but also, you know, in the, in the environment sector as well. Maybe just explain, so I mean, I'm asking that because 
um, just given the level of environmental breaches that we consistently see across Northern Ireland, the level of ongoing disasters that we do have. I mean, ammonia pollution, air pollution, marine pollution, these are just some of the ones that I put down, illegal dumping, even environmental impact assessment and issues around that uh, and being able to hold them accountable in the planning. And I think trees is, is one that you've just mentioned there as well. And we've had a, a recent announcement from the department that they're going to go ahead and plant conifers um, in terms of reforestation when we know that conifers are not what we need. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the reasons that I'm asking there, you know, in terms of what we have in the bodies, the organisations, those driving this forward and what their results are to date is not great, actually mm -hmm. really, really damaging in very many ways. Um, so that was why I was asking that question, but maybe want to ask you then moving on, in terms of this bill not having non-regression explicitly stated, um, and in terms of the protocol that we do have, and what we're hearing reports from Westminster that the government are going to do all that they can or they're certainly going to be looking actively to see what they can do to circumnavigate their responsibility under that. Have you had any feedback from your members um, or have there been any discussions within your sectors as to a reaction to those non-regression and potential breaching of the protocol? Um, yeah, well, with the in relation to non-regression, um, we're part of a coalition called Greener UK, and it goes back to that point that you made about you know Welsh government, Scottish government, everyone is recognising that non-regression is not committed to, mm -hmm. um, and kind of a step further than that would be that there is no duty to apply non-regression to the development of legislation. Currently, in the bill, it only requires having due regard to those principles, which doesn't include obviously non-regression, but in the process of policy making. You mentioned um, environmental impact assessments, that you know, decision making process, non-regression must be underpinned in those processes as well. So it's not even so much as just getting non-regression included in the bill, it's a requirement that it must be applied by all ministers across all of government. Um, that would be kind of the step one of making sure that, you know, as you said, quite rightly said, there are consistent breaches of environmental law. And a point then that goes to, you know, the threat of EU fines have, has perhaps been the strongest kind of deterrent for um, breaches. And that's why there is that need for the OEP to then have stronger enforcement cap capacity. So, you know, having teeth being able to actually take forward further than a judicial review and further than a decision notice to hold the public authorities to account. And then the independent EPA would also then have that capacity to take individuals and organisations and hold them to account. So it's in ensuring that within the bill that independence is firmly established and committed to, and it goes back to then again the issue of resourcing, that their resourcing is not held kind of behind a barrier of, well, you must meet these criteria. You know, it should be that these are independently funded bodies that can function effectively with the sufficient resources to then carry out the need, or you know, to carry out the functions that they're set up to do. Okay. William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your presentation. And with all the doom and gloom, I, I, I'm encouraged to see from '94 to 2017, board, boards, you know, the board public population has increased by 49%. That, uh, that's a surprise to me, you know, but that's good. So we must be doing something right. We're not doing everything wrong, if that's the case. Uh, am I right in saying that? Like, why, what's the reason for the, the big increase in the board population? Some of the generalist species have increased. Yeah. Uh, but that, the, but the, can, what, what, the what do you health, think the reason for that is? Um, looking at the overall health, you need to look at the abundance and the diversity. Yeah. So just because one thing increases, it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole of the system is in good health. So but does there have to be a reason for that? Yeah, think? the conditions in the environment probably uh, favour those gen generalists in the way that the land has been managed. It favours some of those generalist species. Okay. But it's the specialist species and that broader sort of range of species that's really important to have a healthy and functioning ecosystem. You did mention butterflies earlier, there's a big decrease in them. Can you give the reason for that? Is there any particular reason for butterflies population been down so drastically? 
Again, it's, it's the same sorts of things. It's the way we have la managed our land and it's the availability of uh, the particular habitat. Is it not to do with sprays and butter, yeah, things like that? I would have thought. Yeah, yeah it, could, it could well be. It could be to do with agricultural practices. It could be to do with other forms of pollution. We look so at the flies in the house. Range, we all spray to kill the flies, don't whole we? A whole range of things, yes. Yeah. And, that, and that's the same with some of the organisms that form soil as well. You know, soil formation is hugely important. Um, you know, to have productive land for agriculture and everything else, same as pollination. So there's a range of land management practices. You know, you've mentioned spraying. You know, there are other things as well. Um, well I think every house in the country sprays to kill the flies. You know, we do that. Yeah. I mean, that's an issue, you know. I go swatter. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, you mentioned tree cover, and I, I accept it's low maybe in, in Ireland, but that's historic. That's something that's been low tree cover for hundreds of years. Am I not right? No. I haven't, no. got, I haven't got statistics in front of me going back for hundreds of yeah, years, but, but we are historically low. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's not yeah. something that we done yesterday or something that man has done recently. It's, it's an historic situation, I think, in Northern Ireland, to my knowledge. I think there's been increasing deforestation for to, to bring land, and just like land drainage. Yes, but there's been quite a bit of planting this few years. You know, I would have thought that would have probably made up for what you understand. Historically, it'd be interesting to see what the historical situation is. I, yeah, I, do, I don't know if any, if any of us yeah. know. We could try to find out. You know, I, I think... But I think we're better to know before we make... You know, we, we well, should know. We should know. Well, I think, I think we know that it, North Ireland is one of the lowest levels of cover in, in Europe. I, I accept that. Um, but what I'm saying is it's an historical thing. It's not something that happened yesterday or last year or ten years ago. Oh, yeah, no. Historical. Yeah. I, we would agree with that, I think. Yeah, okay. But I think okay. what, what's important is that we understand the role of trees in terms of yeah. the climate crisis that we're facing, in terms of the nature and biodiversity climate that we're facing, and the services that trees and woodlands provide in terms oh, of um, yeah, in terms of human health and in terms of environmental health. So yeah, uh, yeah, uh, the picture um, for Northern Ireland and actually for the island of Ireland in terms of, of woodland it isn't a great one. Um, and we do want to see that addressed. And I suppose further to that point around planting, Let's not forget the importance of hedgerows within the landscape as well. They're really a lot important. Of hedgerows in Northern Ireland, yeah, yeah, so, so they're really a, a well managed hedgerow is really important for wildlife. Yeah. Is really important for pollinators, which y y you're on, on to talking about, and quite rightly re yeah. raising the importance of pollinators. We have much more hedgerows in many areas in Scotland and England. Yeah. I would have thought and a really important part of our cultural landscape as well. Actually, yeah. people are really proud. The farmers are really proud of managing their hedgerows well. So. Absolutely. Okay. Down from around them. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Um, Rosemary. Yeah, my, mine's on a slightly different tack to everybody else has been speaking about. I'm just wondering, is there anything that you see, anything that within your your thoughts in this bill that are conflicting with some of the planning rules and regulations we have here in Northern Ireland? You know, this morning we listened to and they were putting up telephone masks about some of our planning rules are very, very strict in relation relation to other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, well, in relation to the bill, there aren't any provisions for planning, obviously. That no. Be, yeah. Um, but it, what may be brought in as a result of the bill, will there be conflict? Can you receive conflict? I guess it depends on where the will is, where the political will is to kind of step step forward. You know, planning has a role and a responsibility yeah. to obviously protect and enhance nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be the Northern Ireland Assembly has an opportunity to set high targets and high levels of planning regulation that would move us forward into a more nature friendly process of planning. And it's an opportunity that can be taken and we just need the political will to take it forward. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. okay. I'd like to um, thank you, uh, representatives, for attending here this morning for your information and for taking a wide range of questions as well. And um, and uh, again, we'll be I'll be we interfacing with you and being in contact with you as we move on through this bill and in the time ahead. So thank you very much for that. And uh, we'll see the members now that we're suspending for lunch and the um we will resume at 2 p.m in room 29 so take our stuff with us <coughs> we're going next door yes that's an hour and 20 minutes it's not possible to be a bit sooner i know the numbers have all meetings late in the afternoon so i'm only saying it's an hour and 20 minutes
Yeah. 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 Maybe you're those that are coming to make presentations. They're, they're, they're due to hear to a vote. Yeah. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. If there's no other business we can do, that's okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.